we should get started. Um, welcome everyone to this first technical webinar that we're having on to go into detail on some of the indicators in the global biodiversity framework monitoring framework. Um, I just wanted to start by saying for those of you who are not aware, this year we are in the process of leading up to the Conference of the Parties for the Convention on Biological Diversity. At the Conference of the Parties, there will be a new global biodiversity framework which is uh, adopted, um, which will guide the work of the world and guide sort of a, provide a vision for where we want to be in 2050 in terms of biodiversity. And it will also provide action targets of how we get to, to where we want to be in terms of bi biodiversity for the next 10 years. So this is following on from the IACHI framework and hopefully is provides a more ambitious attempt to ensure that we really are able to protect biodiversity and sustainably use biodiversity related resources. So additionally, for the first time, so in contrast to IACHI, the monitoring framework with headline indicators will be formally agreed to um, by the parties as a part of the global biodiversity framework. So what this means is that the indicators that are agreed to will really be used by the parties, will be used in national reporting processes. Um, there will be agreement to use a, a common set of indicators across countries and for global analysis to, to provide um, more national ownership and more focus on really understanding what's happening on the ground in terms of biodiversity. So this brings us to the, to the workshop that we have today. A number of those indicators will of course rely on biodiversity observation network data. Um, this data ideally would be collected locally and feed up so that we can compile indicators at the national or the local level and aggregate up to the global level to understand biodiversity at all levels in all places. Uh, and so this is really the vision of where we want to be with the monitoring framework and specifically with some of the indicators. So today, um, there's going to be a series of presentations. Maybe we go to the next slide. Today, there's going to be a series of presentations and discussions on different aspects of measuring uh, species populations and area-based or area-based measures. And so we're going to have sort of this webinar in three different sections. Um, first, we will talk about some of the species population indicators. This would be the species habitat index and the species index and the species protection index. Um, then we'll have a example of national use and adaptation in Colombia. Um, and then we'll move on to talking about mountain biodiversity uh, and mountain biodiversity in Switzerland. So I hope that this is, is useful for those of you who are who are considering the indicators in the GBF and in terms of better understanding where these indicators come from, how they link with biodiversity observation networks and data collection on the ground, and how these indicators can really be used not only for understanding the global situation, but for informing national and local policy decisions. So to get us started, um, I'm going to introduce just the first two speakers, and then we'll have a brief Q&A on on those presentations and then we'll move on, as I said, to the third speaker and then to the two last speakers. So we have an excellent panel today of experts from around the world. Uh, and the first speakers are going to be Melody McGoach and Walter Juz. Melody uh, studied botany and entomology at the University of KwaZulu, Natal, before moving to Pretoria University. Um, Melody's research has focused on ecology and conservation, populations and communities, and she's the co-chair of the Geobond Species Populations Working Group, which is the research that she's going to be presenting today. She's also the coordinating lead author of the IPBAS Assessment on Invasive Alien Species and Their Control, and the lead of the project on biodiversity status and trends 
uh, securing Antarctica's environmental future. Walter is the other co-chair of the Geobond Species Population Working Group. And he's also the director for the Center for Biodiversity and Global Climate Change at Yale University. He was chair of the IPBES Task Force on Indicators, which includes data and knowledge. He was also one of the lead authors for the IPBES Global Assessment. Um, he has a number of different qualifications, including being on the steering committee of Future Earth's Natural Asset Network. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Melody and Walter for their presentations. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jillian, for your uh, introduction. And uh, greetings, everybody. Um, I'm gonna start, I think, briefly by introducing Geobon uh, to any of you who may not be very familiar with Geobon. And this very brief introduction follows on from the more detailed introductory um, webinar introduction to this series of technical webinars that was held on the 29th of June, uh, presented by uh, the current and past co-chairs of Geobon, Andrew Gonzalez and Mike Gill. And in this webinar, it's been recorded and is available um, to see. They provided uh, some detail on, on Geobon, its activities and its processes and how it is in a position to support the post-2020 GBF. So Geobon is a flagship of GEO, the Group on Earth Observations. Um, it's a large network of researchers and uh, practitioners. As you can see from the map here, each of the colored dots on the map represents the home base of a number of researchers involved in Geobon. And um, Geobon has the goal of acquiring, coordinating, and delivering biodiversity observations. I like to think of it as Geo Geobon's mandate being to improve the quality, quantity, and value of biodiversity information for policy and for management. Geobon um, also, of course, works on delivering indicators based on biodiversity observations, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. But Geobon is a very global and open partnership. And as you can see here, um, it addresses terrestrial, freshwater, and marine, and it has members uh, well represented across all of the world's major regions. Thanks, Walter. Uh, one of the main areas of work of Geobon is essential biodiversity variables or EBVs. So EBVs are really critical to being able to produce and deliver robust, repeatable and sustainable indicators of biodiversity change um, that are useful to countries and also that are comparable across countries. So what is an EBV? Well, we all know that uh, biodiversity by its very name has uh, multiple facets and um, there are many species and there are different ways in which we can measure biodiversity. So the rationale underpinning EBVs is that together they provide a minimum set of measures that complement each other and that together capture the major dimensions of biodiversity change. So EBVs are designed to provide an efficient and effective approach to collecting, quantifying, and reporting on biodiversity change. As you can see in the figure here, there are essentially three steps to using EBVs to produce indicators. So on the left um, is the data that, uh, the raw data, for example, that comes from a very broad range of sources, from surveys, to citizen science and eDNA, as well as from remote sensing. This progresses through a range of biodiversity models, which are used to generate uh, EBVs, which are contiguous in space and time. And for species populations, EBVs uh, represent uh, data on multiple species in broad taxonomic groups. So the whole idea is that once you have your EBV, you can disaggregate it to select the information that you need uh, by country, for example, by taxonomic group, or by time slice. So the indicators on the right, the biodiversity change indicators, they then draw on one or more um, essential biodiversity variables. 
So if we move on to the next slide, thank you, Walter. Um, what has been quite remarkable um, has been the growth in biodiversity observation records, which underpin many uh, different biodiversity indicators needed to report on um, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And um, one of the main sources of data supporting these many indicators is the data on the presence on species presences or occurrences. Um, and GBIF, as you know, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility provides access to data on all types of life on Earth, on all different taxa. And the growth in data accessible through GBIF has, has been quite phenomenal. There's now over 1.6 billion occurrence records across data sources and taxa available um, in the and through the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. If we move on. Here's a map of the density of records. If we go to the previous one, please, Walter. Tim Hirsch is the previous one, Walter. It's slow. Tim Hirsch is in the audience um, and during the chat, if you have any questions about GBIF's delivery of occurrence records for indicators, um, I know he'd be happy to answer any questions. So this is a density map of GBIF records across the world. And as you can see, there's also been a massive growth in the contribution of citizen science records to um, GBIF. So there's been really significant advances in data collection, mobilization, and aggregation. Um, on my slide, um, it's been a bit of a delay, Walter, if you can move one on, please. Yeah, sorry, there seems to be a lag, a melody. Okay. So enormous uh, growth in publicly accessible occurrence records, which are incredibly valuable for informing multiple indicators under the global uh, biodiversity framework. So this figure over here shows, for example, the dramatic growth in annual species records on the left for birds, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. So you can see from the 1950s, there's been dramatic growth in simply raw occurrence records of species. But um, this is, well, this is really good news. This growth doesn't necessarily represent an increase in the value of this information for biodiversity. This biodiversity information is really only valuable if it is increasingly covering and filling the data gaps that we have geographically and taxonomically. So in the figure on the right, um, the raw biodiversity data are modeled to show the growth almost in, you could think of it as um, valuable biodiversity occurrence records because it's occurrence records that actually fill um, an existing gap. But in all cases, this is actually good news uh, for the availability of biodiversity occurrence data to support modeling and the development of indicators. Um, to go back to the three-step EBV process, I thought I would show um, an example. And the example here is using this process of going from raw data collection through biodiversity modeling and the production of essential biodiversity variables to the production of indicators. And here, this is for um, invasive alien species. Now, we're not going to be talking about invasive alien species indicators today, but it's a good example of how uh, Geobon supported EBV development is um, aiding the development of indicators. So if we think about invasive alien species, where did the data come from? They come from country checklists now delivered by the Global Register of Introduced and Invasive Species. They come from GBA for currents records, and importantly, they need to continually and ongoingly uh, be contributed by countries. So countries need to track the distributions of invasive alien species in their countries. And there's a whole bunch of resources available um, to support that process. So these data then go into um, a species population's EBV. Um, essentially a Geobon framework for modeling the data needed to inform on a whole range of invasive alien species indicators. And these are then produced. For example, this indicator shown here 
is for the headline indicator rate of invasive alien species spread. And it can be disaggregated for countries and pathways to show, for example, um, using modeled estimates and levels of uncertainty, how the numbers of invasive alien species are changing um, year on year or decade on decade. So if you want further resources about this particular example, there's some listed um, below there. And I'll pass on to Walter. Great, thank you, uh, Melody. Um, and let me pick up on the dramatic growth of, of uh, in situ, as we say, biodiversity records, so in place observations of species and often also uh, the attributes that they carry and the functions they carry. Now, through the uh, also happening dramatic growth in remote sensing information, we are in a way lifted into a whole new era of uh, global biodiversity science and change prediction. So, uh, on a daily and hourly basis, the world is um, if you will monitor it through a whole range of satellites in 10, 30 meter resolution or coarser or finer, and not just bringing one dimensional information, but a whole suite of different information aspects that address the various facets of biodiversity and ecosystems. So for example, we have now 20 years of MODIS satellite data that allow us to look back and characterize 500 meter pixels around the world in uh, their very intricate cloud cover dynamics. And uh, we have, uh, annual land cover information that's been derived from some of these remote sensing products uh, now for over uh, 20 years in 300 meter resolution done in a very careful standardized way and uh, we'll come back to that uh, as that feeds into some of the indicator products and there's new uh, standardized products on annual level coming at 30 meter resolution and even 10 meter resolution there's some really exciting developments actually happening this very year also uh, in, in association with some of the CBD uh, negotiations. So uh, it's this combination of dramatic growth in occurrence records and dramatic growth in uh, remote sensing data and the sort of information that then these in combination can convey that I would argue bring us, lift us, catapult us almost into a totally new era for global biodiversity change assessment and prediction. So we're in a completely different place than we were 10, 15 years ago when a lot of this data didn't exist at all or was too small, too narrow, too specific to a certain region or set of species to be useful. Right now is that uh, we in the Species Population Working Group were able to sit down together uh, with experts from around the world and think about these new opportunities and conceptualize them in the context uh, of the larger EBV framework that Melody was talking about. So think about these raw data here at the bottom coming through uh, uh, over time, that's the x-axis, and then for different places, that's the y-axis that might be in two different countries. So these are sparse and often biased, but in addition, we have that contiguous remote sensing data and maybe some other species attribute information. And together then through the combination of these data with models, whether the machine learning or traditional statistical models were able to predict in contiguous space and time, these, uh, these biodiversity attributes. And that brings us to the species populations, essential biodiversity variables. And that sort of provides the foundation for a whole suite of potential indicator products, information products, um, not just the ones we're talking about today, uh, but a whole a range of others. But specifically, um, we'll be talking about the species uh, populations EBVs and the species, um, the species protection index and the species habitat index. And uh, in the production of all of this, it's not just about concepts, of course, it's also about the workflows, the infrastructures, the standardization, the metadata, uh, and the provenance of that information, how it's all coming together. And here, Melody already covered Chibif as a really important base foundation. And then in our conceptualization, we had to think very much also about the, the operationalization of this and the map of life as a, the authoritative platform for bringing together this data and doing the fusion of remote sensing and occurrence data to deliver these products in the middle, and then obviously a whole a range of potential users uh, at the other end. So in the larger Geobond context, uh, this is where these two indicators that we are going to, to cover today fit in. In addition, there is another one, the species status information and indicator that addresses information growth, but on the left, the protection index, on the right, the species habitat index. 
It's the global and the national data sources that together combine to deliver the EBVs. And then these deliver the indicators and they then feed into these larger uh, arenas of targets. And here the important thing is that we're not just thinking about goals or targets in isolation, but we're thinking about them uh, addressing both the actions and the state of nature as well as the benefits overall. And, uh, and that's a key aspect of the way these indicators are developed. It's not just about the particular annual value, but also other alongside uh, products that then support further decision support. And I'll come back to that at the, at the end. So it's not just indicator values, but also maps, uh, associated products that can then be used to monitor progress and to prioritize actions and that really um, deliver across the whole range. So these two indicators that we're talking about today have been around for a while. The, the maps, the, the process, even the infrastructure, including that screenshot below, were introduced in 2014 at the IOC World Parks, Parks Congress there, and then saw an initial um, a pickup through uh, the Google. So this was initially uh, developed and is still ongoing. We supported by Google and a whole range of other partners. Um, in uh, uh, across the world and has pr provided for a whole range of publications over the years. It's also been, uh, they've been used in a range of efforts, the Environmental Performance Index and IPBIS as core indicators, as well as in several other uh, arenas. And what's the foundation for these indicators? It really starts with the EBV, but if you think about a particular place, a point in time, it's the, the map ultimately that provides a lot of the support. It's the species put on the map in a, a, a detail that just what previously wasn't possible. So we see here in red, a combination of this expert opinion um, or assessment map product that's there in green that might come out of an assessment or out of a monograph of that species where an expert hand drew this map we see in these points sprinkled for in, throughout, and these uh, are coming through GBIF and then maybe citizen science data or museum data and other such data. But you see the blob and the green points and the points, they give a very like incomplete and uh, rough picture of the species distribution. And it's through the remote sensing and models that you're able to arrive at that more detailed picture and are able to do so for the whole species range. And you can look at the species and others in the link that's, that's pasted below. So this is something that's now become reasonably standard, uh, certainly uh, been developed with a whole range of, of in the larger species populations. And uh, through infrastructure such as Map of Life, we're able to pull these sources together and standardize these efforts to then arrive at products that are not, not only uh, best possible quality, but also have all the metadata associated. Where's the data coming from? How is the national data feeding in? What is the exact single uh, point and source that might be contributing? And that uh, is, is then really powerful when it's coming together in one place, for example, for a single species in a similar way for tens of thousands of species. Here's just one example. The zebra ducker is, a, is a, a, a highly threatened species in West Africa that we're able to now map in really uh, quite a powerful uh, detail here in green, the pixels that are within the uh, what experts consider suitable range, uh, sorry, larger range of the species, but that are also suitable in terms of the remotely sensed land cover and land cover conditions as they pertain to the ecology of the species. So the, uh, which are the ecologically intact places that support the species that have the uh, ecological integrity to be useful for the species. In uh, blue, these points at the bottom, then 159 points that are coming through GBIF that are allow us to validate this particular map. And uh, we learned that uh, indeed we have in green, the color indicates here, uh, we have uh, an improved map as we've been developing this refinement and arrived at this uh, now habitat suitable range estimate of about 31,000 square kilometers for this particular species. This is all embedded by the way, map of life and infrastructure you can play around with it there uh, in a way where you can actually individually uh, change some of these uh, uh, preferences or associations to then maybe at the national level derive your own particular prediction for that species or involve your own expert network. Something else that's coming out of then this uh, 
evaluation at the species level is an assessment of how much different nations hold stewardship for a particular species. So how what portion of the range may just fall into a single country, then it would be a country endemic, or uh, whether one nation here, Liberia, holds particular responsibility for the fate of the species and the functions and supporting services that it offers. So here, uh, Liberia, the key steward for that species, but it shares that stewardship with three other nations. And what we're looking at additionally here is now through 30 meter uh, and 300 meter resolution remote sensing that's been conducted on an annual basis, an assessment of how the uh, ecologically intact uh, habitat and landscape available to this species have changed over the last 20, 19 years. Uh, you see that it's been actually losing range. It's not been gaining. There hasn't been any restoration of the area of the type of habitat it requires. Um, it's losing range and particularly so more in some parts of the range than others. And there's some uncertainty around that assessment that's illustrated through this band. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, not gonna go into the details here, but this validation data that I mentioned earlier allows us to assess the uncertainty in this particular estimate. So quite some dramatic losses of, in this case, uh, 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 forest habitats in uh, uh, Ivory Coast for where that species happens to range in as well as in some other parts for its range. And then we can look at that uh, um, just as sort of the mean estimate without the uncertainty per country over the, the years and um, get an impression of, of how the value of ecologically intact um, uh, a habitat for that species and thus by extension the population size has been decreasing in, in the different parts and how these map up to the different nation, different nations. So this brings us to then um, the question of how you, for a single nation you would calculate this indicator. It's in essence this value that's shown here. And then if you do a comparison of say 2019, against the 2001 baseline, that would obviously be different in the future, maybe a 2019, 2020 uh, baseline. Um, you would look at this, you'd look at that value, right, uh, that it had at the end uh, in this case of this Ducker um, and the case of, I think it was uh, Liberia, we're looking at a 19% uh, loss. So we end up instead of 100 at the baseline, 2001, we now have the value of 81. And uh, we can repeat this exercise for some putative other species B and C. Some other species may have had a gain. Uh, another species C may have had a more dramatic loss. Um, and these species also differ in how much Liberia is a steward for them. So species C actually just ranges a tad bit into Liberia. So the stewardship value is uh, much smaller. Now, the species habitat index is nothing different than the average uh, value of uh, across the species that are being assessed. So the average uh, percent of the original baseline value that you have in a particular assessment year. There's a little twist to this and that it's an average that's weighted by the country stewardship that's given here by that uh, column on the right. But if it's just endemics you're assessing, essentially it's just the, the arithmetic mean of those values. So the species habitat index measures the change in the estimated size of ecologically intact areas supporting species populations. We can repeat this assessment for the hundreds or thousands of species across the world. And here uh, for the four countries that shared stewardship for this particular Ducker, we find that uh, overall Guinea actually almost stayed at the level of hundred and the one country where actually we've seen uh, greatest change in SHI and species habitat index uh, across the, those, those years in the past um, would, be, would be Ivory Coast with about 868 species in that case contributing to that metric. So how does this matter in the larger global biodiversity framework? Uh, remind, uh, let's remind ourselves of goal A, right? Area and connectivity and integrity of natural, integrity of natural ecosystem increased by a certain amount supporting healthy and resilient populations while reducing the number of species threatened uh, and maintaining genetic diversity. With these particular uh, components listed at the bottom and uh, the species habitat index uh, contributes really strongly to the first three in particular. So it really, really strongly is able to capture when calculated for thousands of species that ultimately in their aggregate 
define ecosystems. Ecosystems are defined by their species. They're nothing without the species that actually constitute them. And that becomes even more obvious as we begin to include tree species, plant species in this assessment. So as we do this, um, the SHI addresses ecosystem integrity and connectivity. And connectivity uh, is a simple additional uh, assessment of the distance of these patches at the species level. And it's a de species defined measure, right? Connectivity is also is tied to a species because of the dispersal links that it has, but you can aggregate it across many species. That would be an addition that's not in there yet, but it can be added. It addresses obviously um, the conservation status and extinction uh, assessment of the species and uh, directly uh, allows an assessment of the health uh, and population uh, of the species. And indirectly, as we look at these separate patches and separate populations, it uh, addresses also genetic diversity and, and the protection of critical ecosystems. Um, what's, what's neat about these types of indicators is that they're really able, they're measured on an annual basis. So they have immensely uh, high spatial and I want to emphasize that temporal resolution, they really have this an immediacy, right? As soon as the remote sensing data is in, the latest uh, observations are in, that it can be calculated and updated on an annual basis. It offers up a very high um, uh, spatial resolution, and it can be aggregated and disaggregated, aggregated to the globe, disaggregated down to the single country and the single species that ultimately uh, drive it. Moving on to the species protection index, we're looking at the same map again for the same species, the zebra ducker, but now we look at the reserves, um, whether those be formal protected areas or OECMs, other effective conservation areas that are overlapping with the species range. And we're able to do a pixel by pixel, in this case, one kilometer resolution assessment of the overlay uh, of these reserves with the, the species distribution. Um, and we're able to look at, do, to do these, does this reserve network in this region provide an adequate representation for that species? So the adequate representation target it pops out of a, a, a formula that's by no means perfect, but it's uh, at least something that we globally can go with as a, as a baseline a formula for this species and its range size, it suggests that we aim to conserve at least 44% of its range. And the species protection index that gets applied at the country level, 44% uh, of its range in its country. Here we're looking at the global uh, coverage and about, so the target for 44% would be 13,700 square kilometer, uh, in fact, only about 5,000 square kilometer are under some form of protection. So we are raising about 35% of that representation target. Again, here, the different stewardships. And this is how the different countries perform, if you will, in the adequate representation of that species. So uh, Guinea um, manages to achieve 80% of the target, Liberia 10%, Sierra Leone actually 100%. Um, it protects 50% of the species range in its country, and Cote d'Ivoire um, um, protects 60% of the range in its country and actually achieves 100% of the target. So we can compare countries in this way, and we can repeat, we can then compare that coverage to the actual percent per square kilometers area. And this is where the countries are currently sitting, and there's this 30% uh, aspiration goal going forward. So there's certainly something to be done here in terms of adding reserve network. But as you can see in the case of Sierra Leone, uh, already with a 25% or so uh, protection of the country, uh, it was able to achieve 100% of the Ducker uh, target. We can repeat this exercise for. Uh, thousands and thousands of species um, and then arrive at the average um, value across species. And that's what I'm showing here. So here then the species protection index is given by the average value of all the species uh, for which we could conduct the same assessment as for the Ducker. Again, in, for Cote d'Ivoire, there would be a seven, 800. For Guinea, it would be about 700 species that for which we're able to do that currently with more species being added as we advance this, this modeling effort. 
And uh, we can then look at the trajectory of that SPI, of that species protection index through time. And we can find very different scenarios where, for example, um, in Mongolia, uh, there has been, have been additions to the protected area network simply counted as percent area over the years. But as they were done carefully in terms of re actually representing species adequately um, through some planning process, they were able to actually um, cover sufficiently species uh, in, a, in a very, very powerful way. And the SPI went up dramatically with about uh, a value of 90 uh, at this point. So 90% uh, uh, of target uh, achieved, the protection target achieved for the species in this country. In Sri Lanka, we have a different uh, situation where there's certainly more scope going forward to as further added area gets added to also increase the representation uh, of species in that network. So uh, what we see then uh, here is a, a really a powerful quantitative way to address a whole suite of important components of what's target two and might be changed in its number to target three to protect and conserve um, uh, through protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures, um, a larger number uh, of the planet, larger percent of the planet with a focus uh, on areas of particular importance for biodiversity four components and the SPI is able uh, to address especially the first ones uh, particularly strongly and, and, and the, represent the representation one uh, uniquely so uh, and the first one also in terms of the decision support uh, that's ultimately offered uh, in, in a way that that no other measurement currently would support that. And that brings me to the final point here, that this is not just about calculating annual values and uh, yes, being able to tie them back to the single species that's uh, behind a, a particular aggregate metric, but by having these single species values and maps and having those in high spatial resolution, uh, Geobon, these Geobon indicators and also other Geobon indicators are able to provide decision support. They're able to offer assessment, yes, but additionally also decision support because you can pick, you can point at every single pixel where that change might have happened. You're able to develop uh, through uh, uh, complementarity analytics and spatial optimization approaches, some maps of where if I was able to add to the reserve network, would I get the greatest increase in uh, species uh, representation or in that species protection index? So where would I go? Uh, to uh, increase my country's uh, performance under that, under that indicator. So there are direct maps and other decision support tools then can support that. And that goes all the way to uh, predictions for what is occurring in particular parts of a country. Here, a, a dashboard that was developed with support from the MacArthur Foundation for uh, parts of South America in collaboration with the Field Museum in Chicago, where we were able to, to uh, look at individual parks and have given an initial prediction of the species occurring there. Assessment of species actually have been recorded so far and uh, offer up some uh, uh, guidance for their recording and identification and ultimately support park managers in the region in understanding the performance of their parks and how they contribute to these national metrics. Where to get these indicator calculations and the base data supporting them? Um, you can find the individual species level values on map of life. You can also find them in the future for the Geobon portal as indicator metrics aggregated, as well as uh, in the form of species distribution and abundant CDVs. And you're able to get the annual country level values in the future for the indicators dashboard and UN biodiversity lab, which is just sort of launching and, and, and taking shape. Uh, but in both places, uh, we have been uh, Begun, we have begun the process of actually getting these values over there. So they will be available um, in the summer and fall for direct use. So the country and annual uh, values. But um, as you do your annual national reporting as a country agency, for example, you have multiple options in which you, which you can pick to proceed. So you can go with these provided values. So use the pre-calculated indicator values from any of the above sources. Um, and uh, through that actually get uh, this really good comparability across countries. And there's always a value to those pre-calculated uh, metrics because they offer up this comparability across countries. 
but you can also calculate uh, these metrics, these two indicators entirely independently. So you can use national data to develop these species metrics and we'll hear later uh, from Colombia, for example, about how they're doing that. You might focus on endemic species or species for which you have particularly good data. Um, and then the SPI and the SHI is simply the average value of these species for which you were doing this assessment. Finally, you could um, do the mix and match approach where you uh, remove or replace provided species values with those that you prefer to calculate yourself. So you mix and match uh, as you uh, uh, prefer. Now with that, uh, I'd like to, to thank you and uh, hand back to Chilean for, for questions and then on to the other speakers. Thank you. So anyone who has uh, questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I, I've been sort of reading the questions and also listening to the leading, reading the chat so far and listening to the presentations and I have, just a couple of questions to get us started. Um, so my first question really is. Okay. One second. So my first question really is for Tim. And this question is, you know, when I looked at the, the map that was shown at the beginning in terms of where data is being collected. And then when I look at also the percentage of species other than birds that are being captured, you know, there still are certainly gaps. And I'm wondering, how do you see us moving forward to make sure that we're actually collecting data where we want to collect data at the frequency that we want to, and that we can start creeping up and, and seeing a, a higher number of species being covered? So uh, that's my first question. And then I'm actually gonna I'll ask my second question too, to both Walter and Melody, which is, so then, you know, as this data flows through, and I think you showed just on your last slide that the countries can tailor the, the estimates and come up with their own national indicators. It's easy to say that. However, as you are aware, there's going to need to be um, capacity building. There's going to need to be training. There's going to need to be further engagement if we actually want to see a change and, and have these indicators picked up more and more. And I'm wondering, how do you see the role of Geobon and your role in, in making that transition. So uh, I'll hand over to you first, Tim. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, for the opportunity, Gillian, and thanks very much for the, for the question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important point that um, going through that, uh, the, the sort of workflows that you've seen of the way that um, data flows into essential biodiversity variables and, and then into indicators and policy. I think it's really important not to see this as some kind of passive flow that just appears um, from nowhere. Um, that the whole purpose of GBIF is not as a global body to go out and collect data. Clearly, um, we, we, th there's no way we could do that, but uh, to encourage um, the the flow of data coming from many many different sources all, all around the world, um, and although as you saw from from uh, some of the slides, clearly there has been a great accumulation of data. As you say, it's been very uneven in terms of both the the geographic distribution and the taxonomic distribution of what comes in. And I think one of the the really important ways forward is to make sure that there's always a, a really good conversation, if you like, between the analysis that it is done in the creation of the essential variables and the indicators, understanding then what the gaps are, so that that can be fed back through the institutions around the world that are capable of mobilizing that data, and indeed the funding organizations capable uh, of putting resources into that targeted mobilization of data to fill the gaps. So we're not just relying on, if you like, the opportunistic mobilization of data that's that's gone forward, for example, through um, huge efforts in the digitization of natural history collections and the citizen science networks that are, that are already there, but that uh, target of making data open for this further reuse is influenced by what we know about the gaps and the needs that are uncovered and revealed by this process we're talking about, which is everyone. It's not just global organizations. It's the, it's the users uh, who also can help with identifying potentially where that data is. 
And part of that, yes, is going out and, and collecting new data and putting resources into that. But part of it also is understanding where much of this data may already have been collected from the field, but is still disconnected and isn't, isn't going into that global knowledge base. And that's a lot of the work that GBIF and our, our national nodes and the institutions that work through GBIF, uh, what they can contribute. Um, is to unlock a lot of existing data that is out there, but is either simply not digitized, not online, or is online in, in isolated silos um, that aren't accessible to flow into uh, these the, the, the sort of resources and the indicators that we're talking about here in this webinar. So I would say this isn't just, you know, it's not just EBIF's effort, it's a global joint effort to uh, understand the gaps, not sort of throw your hands up and complain and say but well, we haven't got the data but collectively think about what well, might that data already be or if it's genuinely not there in the field how can we then target the resources to go out um, and intelligently invest in new data collection so i think it's you know it's everyone's business uh, we can we can certainly help with the infrastructure we've got but it's 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 everyone's collective work i think to make sure that these data gaps are are filled as efficiently as possible Thank you for that. Now I'll hand over to Walter and Melody. I don't know who wants to answer or first, but. I just very briefly say that um, in addition to EBVs, um, which is Geobond's main, one of its main activities, its other main activity are the bonds, the, bi the country and regional biodiversity observation networks. And bonds, bonds are being developed um, specifically to, to sort of support the needs that you were talking about, Gillian, um, of countries in terms of capacity building, making the methods um, available for collecting and analyzing data and so on uh, readily accessible. In fact, Maria Cecilia is online and perhaps later she could say something about that um, during this session. There are two interesting questions on the chat that have come up as well. Yeah. I might ball those to Walter. One was about, are these indices applicable in the marine environment? And the other one was about the extent to which this can use, these approaches can use species abundance. Yeah, no, thanks Melody. And, and thanks Tim. Um, and the, uh, so there's a real wonderful synergy here, obviously, between the work from, from by GBIF and all its needs around the world and the work from, from Geo Bonn. And uh, we obviously, uh, dealing with, with a limited, still limited set of, of records and there are wonderful opportunities for, for mobilization. Um, the, the one thing that really makes a difference is that we do not actually, it, it will be impossible for every species to have enough records from every year to give a perfect uh, assessment based on this raw data, right? That's why the remote sensing, bringing in the remote sensing information is so powerful. That really allows us to then look at this 20 years get the temporal signal from the remote sensing and the model-based associations, and then use the limited raw data there is, dozens of points, hundreds of points, to validate that um, as well as parameterize it. So that's why uh, we are in a different spot and why, yes, every record is valuable, but we, we do not have a per perfect set of, do not have to have a perfect set of records for every species to be able to proceed. Now, the question on marine came up. Uh, so the marine, Species Protection Index has been completed for fish and it's under development for crabs. And uh, that will be available later this summer. So the value is already uh, done. And it's the same methodology. You go by EECs, Exclusive Economic Zones, of course, as well as the open ocean. Uh, and uh, the same is true for the Species uh, uh, Habitat Index. So we are, we are adding species uh, at a rapid rate there. Uh, plants are the next group and for trees, for conifers and so cacti, global assessment is already completed and, and more are coming. Um, so that's to, to that question. Um, I think broadly, there is a, through Chiobon and if you've had, the previous recording is still online, the first webinar where, where Andy Gonzalez and Maria gave a wonderful introduction. It's a really powerful community worldwide where there is a lot of support and we're excited uh, as a community to provide uh, further support going forward in helping countries develop some of these indicators uh, locally, nationally, and to develop capacity for doing so. And actually from Maria, we'll hear how Colombia has been doing that. And that can be a good example for some other countries as well. Perhaps back to Chilean at this point. Thank you. 
very much. Um, I just, I think we need to move on because we are out of time. So I'm gonna move to the second presentation or set of presentations. Um, I, I wanted to quickly say that uh, I think all of the experts are very passionate about the work that they're doing. And so I do see that there are some additional technical questions in the chat. Um, I believe that you, you know, I would encourage you to reach out to the experts who are online. I, I'm quite sure that they would be happy to, to get back to you and to share additional thoughts. So with that, I'm going to um, introduce Maria Lindono. She is a senior researcher in the Biodiversity Assessment and Monitoring Program at the uh, Institute the Humboldt Institute in Columbia and co-chair of the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network also, or one of the co-chairs. Um, she is working primarily in the use of geographic analysis for decision-making on biodiversity and on biodiversity indicators. Um, she conducts research related to implement, uh, implementing the knowledge to action cycle related to specific problems in the context of biodiversity and conservation and development. And she is going to really be giving us a presentation on the Columbia example. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Maria. And thank you, Julian. Thank you, um, Walter, Melody, Adriana, for organizing this um, session. Um, OK, so <clears throat> I'm going to show you the example of, of Colombia. This is a work uh, done in a, in a network in the, in the Bonn, Colombia. Uh, part of um, being um, in this GeoBond network has helped us uh, to do um, all the work uh, we are going to show you here because we are related, you know, as, as a country with these um, global experts and our national experts can interact with this global community and um, this has been an effort, what I'm going to show you, of um, several years now, almost eight years working on this. Uh, but it's really nice to see how um, the, the bond, the country has adapted all these uh, theoretical uh, things you have uh, seen that Walter and Melody had uh, explained. So first I want to say that the, this, this work I'm going to, to show you is a is an is a work that is done in a, in a network, and are there are three important players in this uh, network for the for the species uh, indicators. The first one is that the Ministry of Environment supports all this work, and and that is really important for uh, the country to to have this uh, information as as official. The second is that the Colombian GBIF note is part of this effort also. So all the records and, um, and the data aggregation uh, is, is supported by all this GBIF work. And third, there is a network of, of experts, experts, uh, people that know about the individual species, their biogeography, where they are, how they live, and where uh, they have the, the knowledge gap <laughs> also. Um, in their heads and they know where data is and and they can help us a lot in 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 sorting out uh, these data gaps that have been um, arising the in the chat as, as a main concern so um Bio, biomodelos is our our effort to to develop the species distribution models the species distributions ebb and this is done as i mentioned by all these parts together um, being Humboldt Institute, the one who um, who shares, let's say, this this initiative and and coordinates all the efforts. So it starts by uh, putting all these uh, actors together and having a planning um, on on how the distribution of the species is going to be work in the different taxonomic groups where we have, uh, uh, let's say. A subgroups of experts working on individual taxonomies, uh, different taxonomic groups. So um, after the planning is done, there is a step where um, there is a data aggregation. So all the data that is in GB in other repositories and where the experts put their own data in also. 
and uh, quality assessment of all this data is done. Then uh, there is some collaborative data cleaning and, and that assures the quality of the data. Uh, then the, the Humboldt teams uh, makes the models, uh, and that is a step four. And in a step five, the experts uh, again look at these models and verify them. And at the end, they give a uh, quality to the to the models, uh, to the maps that are generated. So uh, through this uh, workflow, um, we are sure that what we have is the best information available for each of the species uh, that we work in this in this process. Um, in the in the platform, you can find the map of each of the species we, we work and the two two indicators, the representation in protected areas of that species and the habitat lost of that um, species. So um, Biomodelos is, um, is, is now involving more than 523 experts um, in, as I mentioned, in this work, in this uh, work, uh, workflow. And um, there are 22 active groups that are working on different taxonomic groups. Um, we have uh, currently 2,331 uh, published models, um, and uh, we are working on another 2,000 models um, in, in this process. It's, it's just, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, for, a, for a mega diverse country, 4,600 species seems uh, uh, a small number, but it's really uh, a lot of information where we can start to understand a lot of what is happening to our biodiversity. So I'm going to make uh, the first example of the species protection index. This is slightly different, but once you have the species distributions maps, you can go on uh, to calculate this type of indicator. So you have the representation goal as um, Walter uh, explained also for his example. So that is the, the area of each species distribution that should be represented in the protected areas. And uh, then you measure the, uh, the amount of, uh, of area of each species um, that is really present in the protected areas. That will be um, number B. And then it's easy if, uh, well, to say if you are meeting or not that representation goal. If, if B is less than, uh, than A, then, well, you haven't met the representation goal of, of your species. And on the, on the other way around, if, um, if the area in protected areas is, is the same as the one you expected in the representation goal or, or, or bigger, then you have a good representation. I'm going to jump to the tables uh, to show you how we are doing this um, in, in Colombia for the in in in, as, in association with the with the national um, system of protected areas and their new policy, and this indicator uh, is called um, bien representado in Spanish in in um, in, in Colombia. But um, the the national um, unit of of, of uh, protected areas has identified some units of um, of analysis that are important for their um, organization and decision making. So the countries split around um, different units units uh, of analysis. That is that number you can see in the first column, UAE. And for each of those uh, units, you have a number of species that are present, that is S. Then you have the number of uh, species that have met their representation targets, that is PR uh, and, the, and the date, the, the next column. And then uh, you have uh, simply a percentage of the species in each of those units that meet the target. And that is the indicator, that percentage you can see there. Uh, then you can map that percentage uh, based on, well, or color the, the areas, the, the protected areas uh, with the, the representation uh, index. Uh, for the uh, for the area of analysis where this has been uh, run, and you can see, for example, here the difference between uh, the analysis in 1990 and in 2018, 
And um, so you can see how, for example, in the Andes region, uh, there are a lot of coloring starting to, 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 to make up to, to uh, in, in 2018, a lot of greens and yellows that are coming because the system is adapting to get a better representation of, of the species. Uh, you can also have this indicator um, with, uh, with uh, uh, aggregated in different um, sub-regions in, in Colombia, so the Amazonian region, the Andea region, or the Savanna region, or the Pacific, and you can see the trend in, in time for this indicator. So is, this is kind of uh, the, um, well, it's, it's the same idea of the Species Protection Index. It's a methodological, a little bit different, but it's the same um, ingredients into the, into the indicators, uh, what we have been uh, working on. Uh, now I'm going to show you um, our, our version of the Species Habitat Index. So, for each um, species that is modeling in biomodelos, uh, you have some statistics. So um, you have here the map of an endemic primate that is uh, in the is, is present in the in south um, west western Colombia, and uh, you can see um, in 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 this um, in this data, uh, for example. Um, here, the, the metrics around uh, the amount of a species distribution that, that this species um, has, the, the area of this distribution, then you can see uh, the different cover um, of, of forests that it, it uses, cover uh, forest uh, types. And then uh, you can see how much of the uh, species distribution is, is, um, is um, occurred or overlapping protected areas. And then you have here the first um, graph where you can see these lines. Um, in, um, in blue, you have a, a line that goes from 1990 to, um, to 2012. And you can see here how uh, the species habitat uh, has, been, um, has been reducing uh, through the years because of uh, forest loss. And then uh, from 2012 onwards, you have here at some trends of uh, future uh, models of forest loss in, in Colombia and how those um, futures will, um, will change uh, the species distributions. And uh, you have also in this um, graph um, of, um, of um, this, this graph where you have um, the human footprint and this a small triangle in the middle of these uh, colors is the area that the, the species uh, occupies in the different um, human footprints. Uh, you can aggregate um, a lot of these species, endemic species especially, and then you can see in the map of the, of the right, uh, for example, where the endemic richness is and how uh, that is affected by deforestation fronts that is the, the dark, um, mm, points here in this map. Uh, so this is the, the example of what we have been doing in Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is an effort, as I said, of, of um, many, many people working on, on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I have a question. Um, I think, as probably everyone in the webinar is seeing, Colombia is quite advanced in terms of doing this type of analysis. And I was wondering if you have sort of advice for um, different countries that are just starting the process, how do you really get started in determining which species you wanna look at and, and get a program moving in a direction that's going to work for your national context? I mean, assuming that you were somewhere else. Thank you. <laughs> yes, well, we, uh, the, I also want to mention that everything, every every code for what we have been developed is openly available. This is open access, so you can replicate this this work. And the Biomodelos team is really happy to support you and the Colombian born in in, in repl replicating what we have done. Now, the I think the the key of the success of this um, work is having the experts with you, the biogeographers as a network. Uh, and in that sense, you have to work with them, respecting like their um, their working interests. 
So the, the species, for example, are, are selected with them based on, um, on for example, for example, all the, all the primates were done. So, so we, 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 we talk with the primate sociology of Colombia and we say, okay, we have this project, we have the support from the ministry, we need to work together on this. And then um, all the primates were modeled. No, but is, is this agreement to have them on board and to, to work with them? You have to have a, 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 a team that is constantly uh, moving the network and maintaining it alive. I think that is the first or the most important thing. And obviously the, the GBIF node in, in, in Colombia has been of great, great effort because the, the, the people, uh, the experts in Colombia, the scientists are now more um, sensitive to sharing the data and they feel sure, well, secure, they have this platform national to mobilize the, the data. So, um, so yes, that is, I, I think that that is uh, my, uh, my uh, advice, um, well, is to, to start from the, from the information there exists that yeah, is available globally. And I'm sure that you can move um, with that, um, in, in integrating in the, the network in your country. Um, Thank you. So before I go to the final set of questions, uh, presentations, there is a question on the chat of how you set the national targets um, on species in Colombia. And I, I also think that's a useful clarification. Yes, um, I can provide you with more uh, specific information about that, but because I'm not the one calculating that <laughs> indicator, but um, what I know is that depending on the type of the species and the, and the range amount, the biggest, the area of distribution, uh, the, the percentage of representation is smaller, basically. So if you have very narrow distribution um, of, of a species, then you, want to have a hundred percent of that species uh, represented so it's like in inversely proportional to that uh, species range let's say and there is a, a formula they use to to calculate that uh, it also has to do with the um, uh, species uh, threat uh, a little bit also the amount of of target um, that is uh, required thank you so uh, thank you for this. It was really interesting to see how the work that's being done sort of by Giovanna at the global level corresponds with the national level case. I, I think this is particularly useful in the context of what we're proposing in terms of national ownership in the, in the convention um, processes. With that, I think now we'll move on to our final presentation. So we're switching gears a little bit and really going to look at um, how mountains are being captured in the indicator work. And so I'm going to introduce two people that have been working in the, on work related to the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment Program. Um, Davna Erbach is an evolutionary biologist who's been working uh, for the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment Program since 2016. Um, currently as the program's executive director. Um, and in her position at the International Project Office of the Assessment, she supports a large portfolio of initiatives, including sustainable management of mountain biodiversity, assessment conservation, um, and the policy relevant mountain biodiversity indicators. Additionally, we have Ava Spen, who is a plant ecologist by training and a member of the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment Steering Committee. Uh, she works on the science, interface, science policy interface of biodiversity with the Swiss Biodiversity Forum at the Academy of Sciences in Switzerland. And she's looking at the international linkages, but also supporting the, the Swiss delegation in terms of the Convention on Biological Diversity negotiations. Um, she coordinates the Swiss IPES program, our platform, um, and links with Future Earth and, and Geobon and is, has a lot of expertise related to 
this interaction between mountains, mountain related indicators and, and biodiversity. So with that, I will hand over to the two of them. Thank you. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, perfect. Well, thank you very much for handing the microphone over to me. I believe I have little time, so I will try to speed up. Um, and uh, I will try to catch those of you who wonder, well, why mountains now? Why not uh, stick to those regions of the world where people live and where biodiversity data can actually easily be collected, um, whether in situ or remote, and, and where actually a lot of biodiversity data exists? Why go uh, to mountains? And um, well, there are at least three good reasons for looking at mountains. And the first is that actually the very numerous mountains uh, that exist on Earth, and you see a map of uh, three um, around 300 polygons um, of mountains that uh, can give you a good sense of where mountains are, that is really everywhere. And um, all those very numerous mountains have something in common. And uh, this is that they represent su successions of uh, very species rich and species diverse um, ecosystems. It's as if you were you would stack the, all of Norway from its very tundra top to the very south of Norway, just in a couple of kilometers going uphill. Uh, and so there are various ecosystems with very, very many uh, species. And there are also a, a, a large diversity variety of um, environmental conditions um, that allow, in fact, mountain species to live, um, but also other species, which with time can't make it really anymore where they used to live, to find the habitats which are actually suitable uh, under various uh, global change conditions. And uh, these mountains are really important because they host a uh, very diverse biodiversity, but they also offer space for species um, to, to, to find a refugium. And another region, reason for why mountains are important um, is that they are actually not only species rich and with very many endemic species and numerous world biodiversity hotspots, but um, they are also really at risk. Uh, a number of, uh, of drivers, be it uh, land use change, climate change, pollution, etc., represent a large threat to mountains and to those very numerous species. Um, and as you can see in, the, in this figure, uh, from the Andes to the African continent to uh, Asia, uh, all ecosystem types, all um, uh, levels uh, in, the, in the, um, along the slopes of mountains are exposed to uh, global change drivers, which put their uh, species at threat and uh, also their habitats. Um, so that's another additional reason for why mountains matter. But the third reason is also that uh, mountain biodiversity is important for sustainable development. It supports a very large number of ecosystem services. We often speak about water coming from mountains, but biodiversity is important for food, uh, yeah, for food, for safety, for climate um, mitigation. And um, if this biodiversity in mountains is lost, uh, this means a big threat to actually achieving progress towards not only biodiversity uh, goals and targets, but also sustainable, de sustainable development goals and targets. So there, there, there's really a, a strong need to uh, be aware of how important biodiversity in mountains is and actually to protect it and to take action to uh, safeguard those habitats and their integrity and the intactness and their connectivity. And um, this is why at the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment, we are campaigning nearly uh, to, um, to, for indicators that can, can actually allow us to, to follow what's happening in mountains, where biodiversity is going and, and what needs to be done to protect this biodiversity. And in our network that now is growing, uh, luckily in, in, in number with many experts from around the world, we are working hands in hands um, with developing tools like the inventory that I was showing early on in the map, but also working groups and projects to really um, support the community in delivering the, the information that's needed um, for uh, science-based policymaking and, um, and, uh, and uh, raising the awareness of how important it is to, to protect mountain areas 
um, and their habitats for species that are currently living in mountains, but also futures, future species who will want to move into mountains um, to survive. And it turns out that um, the indicators that we've been discussing today, the Species Habitat Index and the Species Protection Index can very well be uh, calculated uh, for mountains as well, making them really very interesting management and policy tools. And I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of slides illustrating examples um, on the uh, Guatemalan wool on how this ind those indicators can be calculated for mountains. Um, and the fact is, and we've talked about data availability, the availability um, that data missing in mountains, but uh, I think remote sensing and the fact that those uh, indicators are based on um, EBVs is powerful because even though remote sensing in mountains is, is not quite where it could be or should be, it is a very, very important tool for um, uh, mountain biodiversity conservation. So um, as uh, Walter was presenting, and we also had examples from uh, Colombia, the species habitat index can be calculated for mountain species. You see the example of the wool was as before, red and blue, red showing where habitat has been um, uh, decreasing. And um, as you will see on the next slide, you also have for mountain species, the habitat suitable range with very large margins, partly probably because the, the information available for mountain species is, is maybe not quite yet sufficient. But the fact is that there is enough data um, that can be used to calculate this habitat suitable uh, range and um, um, see how uh, individual, individual countries are doing in terms of, of habitat conservation. And here you can see the example of Mexico and Guatemala for this particular bowl. And based on the calculation that uh, Walter showed, we also here see that there is a, um, a decrease in, uh, in, um, in range that is suitable for those wool. And again, this is only one example of a species. And if you take many of them, it points to where um, habitat conservation is urgently needed in mountains to make sure that uh, existing species can survive and that new species can also survive by the time they arrive there. And I'm speeding up to make sure that Eva also has time. Uh, here we, we go to the Species Protection Index. And here as well with available data and hopefully more data in the future, um, it is possible to calculate uh, the Species Protection Index also in mountains, giving us uh, a tool to, to speak to policymakers in, in how to best uh, protect a species and where to, to develop protection um, to ensure that um, important mountain species um, survive. And uh, as before, you can look at uh, the protected range, the tar targeted protection, and the actually realized uh, protection for this particular species and, and evaluate what um, regions of, uh, or what parts of mountain ranges should be prioritized in terms of conservation and protection um, to make sure that this species and other species can, can survive in the present and in the future. Now, I've, I've went through those slides very quickly. Here again, you can also reach out to me if you want more details, and I will hand it over to Eva now um, to pick up on those indicators and, and um, give us an insight from the Swiss perspective. Thanks a lot, Daphna, and thanks everybody for the invitation to Jet Geobon and the CBD Secretariat for organizing it. So um, I wanted to add um, the, a mountain nation perspective on these indicators uh, from Switzerland. And can I have the next slide, Daphna? So uh, with GMBA and um, MRI and UNEP, we, we made a, a little uh, brochure, a policy a brief to elevate mountains in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to make sure they, they, don't, they are not forgotten. And, um, and uh, that was published already in 2020. And then, next slide. Um, when the monitoring framework uh, was published, we also used the opportunity to look at the indicators specifically uh, for mountain biodiversity conservation. Um, and you see uh, in the headline, the two headline indicators uh, in red are the, the ones uh, introduced today, species habitat index and, and protection species protection index. Um, the criteria we had 
uh, of course, can they be disaggregated for mountains specifically? And you have just seen that uh, with Daphna, she just showed it. And then some quality criteria such as are the data publicly available? Uh, is there a regular update? Is the maintenance of the indicator? And, uh, and also is the methodology um, scientifically sound and published and peer reviewed? Um, so we, we found these two headline indicators uh, suitable for mountains, as you already have seen. And then the next slide um, gives you the national perspective on indicators in Switzerland. We assessed the whole monitoring framework, all the indicators from a national perspective. And these were the criteria we had um, for, for, from Switzerland. So, um, some are the same, like um, the quality issue, uh, uh, and then the institutionalized issue are the indicators hosted by institutions which are long term and, and guarantee the uh, availability of, of the indicators um, in the forthcoming years. Uh, is it a BIP approved indicator? Um, and then some. Um, criteria which um, um, relate the indicator with the target. So is it unambiguously measuring the, the aim of the target? Um, is there preferable, we would like to have just one indicator for each monitoring element um, and they should be addable. For example, uh, different ecosystems just could add to uh, ecosystem extent. Uh, covered, and um, and then um, also very important in Switzerland because we we very much um, look at the synergies with other reporting processes, um, and we wanted to have uh, indicators which which could um, also help to feed um, reporting, to, for example, to the SDG targets and and other uh, multilateral environmental agreements. And there is the start the data reporting tool uh, for these um, multilateral environmental agreements um, where, where you put in the information and then you get, um, you can reuse the, the data and information to report to different conventions. So uh, these were our criteria. And then the, the next slide shows, um, uh, in there was a, also an evaluation done by the WCMC and they had almost the same criteria as we had. And if you, you see, um, these are uh, for the two indicators and Walter already mentioned that um, they suit um, various monitoring elements of different uh, goals and, and targets. And if, if it's in bold, it even um, is a top, uh, ranking indicator uh, fulfilling all the nine criteria they had. So um, uh, next slide. Um, I just wanted to to say that um, for for national reporting, uh, we need to have these scientifically sound indicators to compare across countries and over time, just to make sure that the um, the post twenty twenty uh, framework um, can be implemented in a in a much better way because you can also uh, then um, see performance over time and across countries and the scalability is really uh, a key criteria so it uh, if it should be scalable uh, down scalable from global to national scale and and the other way around which is the case of, of these uh, EBV um, indicators and of course uh, the availability um, hosted by trusted organizations um, remotely sensed for example and combined with in situ data and then uh, another important thing is that they are they are customizable so uh, if your country has great data such as uh, Switzerland you can mix and match your your data with the ones provided then um, from uh, the UN Biodiversity Lab or the BIP dashboard. 
So um, just, yeah, that was uh, just a brief um, uh, report on, on what like, yeah, countries like to have uh, for reporting um, to contribute to, to um, policy assessment and, and scenarios for, and also for better implementation of the, of the targets, which are now, we, which were just published uh, uh, a few hours ago and will be hopefully um, adopted by COP15. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I, I just have a, a quick question, I guess, for you both in, in terms of, um, have you, I mean, obviously the new indicators for the GBF have only just gone online. So I think probably this is something that would need to be looked at, but I'm wondering if you have done sort of an analysis of which goals and targets and indicators are relevant for mountains and should be disaggregated by mountains. And the same actually for the essential biodiversity variables. Do you have sort of guidance on how do you make this mountain angle in, in the different um, essential biodiversity variable indicators? So not just the underlying data sets, but really when you compile indicators, how do you use these to compile mountain related indicators that match the same methodology as the overall national indicator. Um, and we've talked about this before. And how do we move towards having a consistent definition or approach to defining mountains um, uh, across countries? Thanks. So I'm not really sure which of my questions. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Eva, do you want to pick up the first one and I pick up the second one? Um, yeah, um, I, probably you start with the second. I think that's a better start. Yeah, so to the question of mountain definition, this is the, the eternal question, <laughs> what the mountain is. And, and um, there have been various, uh, various definitions used and none is right, none is wrong. Uh, they are useful for different, for different reasons, for different contexts. And um, I think uh, there's uh, the need to understand um, for what context one wants to use a mountain definition before applying one. Uh, the one um, we have developed for, uh, within GMBA is really um, focused on mountain biodiversity and is, is uh, the very um, narrow or the most narrow definition that uh, is out there. Um, and we can we can justify its use uh, based on a certain number of criteria. But again, um, different countries will want to possibly have a certain flexibility. But what we can um, uh, encourage countries to use is in fact uh, the tool that is currently in, in in development and will be available very soon is this mountain inventory, which is um, um, a very large data set of polygons that. Um, identify mountain ranges worldwide based on a very standardized method and uh, that can be used in combination with um, uh, different in fact mountain definitions to delineate uh, mountain extent and uh, by applying such an inventory which is a standardized tool we can get to a global agreement on what mountains is because the methods used to develop um, this inventory are, are very very standardized so I, I encourage uh, the community at large to reach out to us uh, for, for the use of this inventory that will become available within the, the coming weeks, hopefully. Also on the Mountain Biodiversity Portal, which is a, um, a sister portal of Map of Life that is specific to mountains and enables um, users to, to, to zoom into mountains if this is the, 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 the biomes they're interested in. And for your first question, Gillian, not sure if I got it right. Uh, one uh, one criteria is 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 it disaggregable for mountains, and it's because the species are are really um, confined to specific habitats, so it, that that is quite important that it can be um, um, applied to to single species, um, for example, um, uh, and they many mountain species are. Um, uh, geographically confined to 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 mountain to single mountains, so it's important that um, 
ähm, ja, ähm, how, yeah, that, the, yeah, they cannot be applied to single species. And um, yeah, what, what I also like about the uh, species habitat index is that you have the stewardship of single countries for, for species. Um, that is also great because many species are endemic or rare. Um, and then they can be, uh, that can be acknowledged, uh, the stewardship of, of a country for, for them. So I think that's why they are quite suitable for mountains. And we have many more criteria for in the, in the brief, for example, um, do they acknowledge ecosystem specific risks and needs in mountains or reduce pressures? and facilitate biodiversity conservation in mountains. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. I think, um, unfortunately, we are reaching the end of our session today. I, I would like to thank everyone for the very interesting presentations and the work. And I, I, I just want to sort of conclude by saying, I mean, as you heard from all of the speakers, there is a wealth of information out there in terms of better measuring biodiversity, better measuring species populations um, and, and drilling down even into specific habitats. And even though you know, we are presenting um, this work as something that can be drawn upon, you know, there is still going to be a need for us to invest in, in data collection, invest in making sure that we um, are able to fully use the data that is available and to forming the link with the, the policy cycle. And I think that this is really where the link to the global biodiversity framework comes in is that we need to make sure that these indicators are not just being compiled and, and isolated in the scientific community, but they make it through and really inform decision-making at the highest level. And to me, this is the real purpose of the webinar and of the monitoring framework under the global biodiversity framework is to try to improve the link from the excellent data and indicators that exist and how this translates into actually changing the decision-making process. And I think that this is, is really where we're going. And it, it's an exciting time to be working on all of this because of the fact that we are seeing a move in that direction and a realization that, that this is the direction that we need to go. So with that, I again would like to thank everyone for your time, for joining us, uh, and, and thank everyone for the excellent presentations.